I preach in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need more daffodils. That was the theme of last year's floral de decorations at St. John's. So many people had come in to decorate the church the Saturday before Easter. And they put up forsythia and cherry blossoms at the end of each pew. And then came this explosion of lilies and these gorgeous, huge blue hydrangeas on either side of the altar. And then we kept waiting and waiting and waiting for the florist to show up because we, he had pre-ordered for us um, loads of daffodils and hyacinths from a flower grower three or four weeks earlier. And he timed it perfectly so that they would be in their peak for us on Easter Sunday. And so we waited and we waited and then finally the florist showed up. And despite all the planning, the daffodils weren't open. They were just still little buds in their pots. And with a little bit of snark, I said, nothing says Easter quite like unopened flowers. But still, we put them all around the altar, tucking them into the spaces, and we were hoping that their green leaves and their buds would fill in the spaces and add to the beauty. And we stepped back and we looked and we said, okay, is it all right? And then Sheba said, we need more daffodils. And she was really determined about it. And so late in the day, Sheba and Presley and I raced into our cars and we went to th two or three more stores and we bought every daffodil we could find not because it was the rational thing to do and not because it was absolutely critical to Easter, but because we wanted Easter to feel like Easter. We wanted it to be beautiful like it always is. We needed more daffodils. I was gonna, preach a completely different sermon this morning and then this it came to me as I was coming down for my coffee this morning as I was getting ready for this service I looked at my home altar the sacred space that we've set aside in our home during this holy week just like many of you have set aside a, a sacred space and I wanted to put flowers on it but we don't have any flowers in our yard right now and all I could think of is we need more daffodils. So I got in my car and I raced over to the church. And please forgive me, Bob and Linda and Barbara Thornton, our grounds team, but I cut some daffodils from the flower beds by the church door early this morning to bring them home. First, I cut just a few, but then I kept cutting more and more because all I could think was, we need more daffodils. For Easter because I think we're all longing for it to feel like Easter again for things to be beautiful again for things to go back the way things were before when will things go back to the way things were when will we be safe again? When will things be normal again? When will we get to see each other again? Sing again, choir, we miss you so much. Have Eucharist again. That day will come, but I think we all know that it will never be just the way it was ever again. And so we're grieving. Something has been lost. A carefree, intimate way of life has been lost. And we're grieving. But we still long for the things 
the way that things were. We want more daffodils because they remind us of what we had. It was so beautiful. Even through their grief, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb again. They did that. They had seen their Lord crucified. They knew Jesus was dead. They knew that he had been buried. There was nothing that they could have done for him. They knew that things would never be the same. But still, they went to the tomb because they were longing for what they knew. Perhaps they were looking for some miracle that would take them back to the things where, the way things were before. But things could never go back. What they found instead was an empty tomb and a message from an angel. Look what he says. He says, I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. For he has been raised, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. In other words, look at it. He's gone. And then the angel turns to them and says, go quickly. Now you go and tell the disciples. So they did leave the tomb quickly. And it says they did that with fear and great joy. They left with fear and joy. That's so true and beautiful. We keep going every day with fear and joy. Both emotions are present. Both emotions are real. We go forward, but whether we get back together again on April 30th, or May 30th, or some other time in the future, it won't be exactly the same as it was. We all know that. But maybe the glimpses of resurrection are found in this question. What if this does change us forever? What will emerge from the tomb and change us forever. I've heard and seen glimpses of the resurrection from all of you in the last week. You've been telling me that you're getting more rest and making more connections, even in your isolation. All of us are beginning to learn how to reflect on what is really essential. We have the time to live with our thoughts. And sometimes that's really hard. Our unresolved thoughts and feelings we didn't even know we had. And some of us are beginning to understand the inner work that we still have to do. We're reconnecting with friends and family. We're saying things that have needed to be, be said maybe for a long time. We're caring for our bodies. Can you believe how many people are out walking? And we're caring for our spirits. And we're caring for each other. It's extraordinary stories of people doing that in amazing ways. And we're allowing ourselves to be restored. What if this does change us forever? I heard an interview with an epidemiologist the other day that sounded more like it was an interview with a theologian or with a great spiritual teacher. The interviewer asked him, how will this pandemic end? And he said, this is a scientist, he said, it will end only when and if the whole world works together in cooperation, in unison, in harmony, as the one connected interdependent organism that we are. 
Folks, we are all connected. If we carry the image of the body, St. Paul called it the body of Christ, all things working together for the whole, none being able to say to anyone else, I have no need of you. If we've held that image in our hearts and minds as a metaphor, now we can see more clearly that it is a reality. We are all connected. Maybe this has changed us all forever. Now, even as I say this, I know that there is still suffering and there is still pain all around us. Medical workers and people who are working on the front, front lines, placing themselves at risk, are doing that every day. And people are losing their jobs and we're losing friends. Some of us are losing our lives. Are we grateful for this pandemic? No. Are we grateful for this virus, for the loss, for the death in it? No. No. But the meaning is not in the death. I learned that from David Kessler. He's a great teacher about grief this week in a podcast that I heard. Let me say that again. The meaning is not in the death. The meaning is what comes after it. The meaning is what comes after it. The meaning comes when we acknowledge what it is that we're going through. The meaning comes when we acknowledge what has been lost. The meaning comes when we acknowledge that the world has changed forever. And the world, whatever it is now, will also have joy and beauty in it too. Just will. And so we press on. We glimpse the resurrection already. And even in our fears that we still have, we ask, what are we willing to risk to find joy and beauty again? Amen. Amen. Okay.